turned a single talk on faith into a mega series on the book of James. Well done. And I did promise that this week would be the last, but I lied because I couldn't get through the whole of chapter 5 in one morning. So we're going to cut it in half and next week will be the conclusion. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that because I might lie again. Hopefully it'll be the conclusion, depending on where God takes us. I, I'm actually a little bit uncomfortable in all that because I, some of you probably know that I'm quite anal in the way I approach teaching and, and I tend to have a bit of a program I tend to plan ahead and I started this series with the intention of doing another teaching series and we got stuck into faith and it really triggered something and hopefully it's working for you. Uh, it's definitely working for me. So I'm much more full of faith and hopeful and all those things. So God's ministering to me through this. I hope he's doing it for you as well. But we looked last week at James chapter 4 and the importance of submission. Really it's a key object, isn't it? And it should be a given. You, we would think that as Christians, that's number one. Unfortunately, the evidence is that that's not so much the case. When you look around at many people in the church, we just don't see that thing going on. Most of the people that come to me, and this is, uh, you know, object, uh, not, it's subjective, I guess. I haven't counted statistics. But many people that come to Deb and I for pastoral help and counselling, you poor guys, um, it comes down to the fact that often people aren't under submission to God. We're doing our own thing and then asking him to give his stamp of approval to it. So it's all round the wrong way. We need to read chapter 4 of James and absorb it and take it in. Now I'm not speaking to you guys but it's your friends. It's the people out there. All right? Because we're, we're all in submission to God, aren't we? Amen. Anyway, faith has a fertile seedbed in the lives of people who choose to continuously live in submission to God. And so what that means is we actually build faith when we choose to come into submission to Him. And it's a game changer, it's a life changer. It and it works, this thing works. But it requires humility, which is the other thing that goes with submission. And so we looked last week at the contrast between humility and its kind of counterpart, which is ambition. And on the one hand, humility brings us into submission to God. And on the other hand, ambition brings us into submission to whatever we desire. And if you're a scholar of the Scripture, or even a student of Scripture, as we all should be, you will know that looking at the life of Israel, that the nation of Israel and others in Scripture, other characters... There is often this thing where people come in and out of submission to God. Whenever they're out of submission, life becomes a disaster because it's all about what we desire. And, you know, history repeats itself over and over and over again. We live in a, an age now where this is huge, where the individual is so big that everything else is, counts for second, that everybody wants equality for something, whatever their agenda is, whatever their barrow is, whatever it is that they're trying to push. And so humble submission to God, God grows faith and ambition for our goals and dreams usually works against faith. Now I could say always because my tendency is to think always but I'm erring on the side of caution this morning. I've never yet seen an ambition that came from God. Now I, I'm happy to be proven wrong but I think those two things are diametrically opposite. Someone asked me a couple of weeks ago after I'd spoken about ambition and he said what kind of ambition are you referring to? And I paused for a nanosecond and my reply to him was actually it's all ambition. There's no ambition that's good because it's all centered on us. Ambition has an agenda, has a goal. And so many of our dreams, as, as we had ministry time last week, if we're honest, are actually full of our own ambition. Now, the goal of the ambition may not always be bad, but oftentimes it's, it's the means to the end that is the problem. And so ambition by its own self-definition is self-centered. It's about us. 
And on the other hand, humility, in a biblical way, is God-centered. Now, it can be other people-centered, but when we're referring to, uh, to James and faith, humility is God-centered. And so it accepts that he's king and that we must be in submission. That requires humility to do that. And we usually vacillate. In other words, we can spend some time, and often for some people, it's an hour and a half on Sunday mornings, where we get all religious and we come before God and we feel, you know, the presence of God. And all of a sudden, we get, we're, we're in submission for half an hour or an hour and a half. Come Monday morning, clock on, bang, and it's all about us. We completely forget about it. So I'm, I'm speaking generally. Again, it's your friends, it's not us. None of us do that. And so this morning, we're going to move into the first part of James 5 because this letter, the more you read it, is an absolute masterpiece. This passage of Scripture continues to build the profile of a faith-filled believer by underscoring the importance of two major things that we're going to look at this morning. And one of them is the handling of money, and the other one is patience in the waiting. So this morning, and most mornings, in, on Sunday morning when we come together, we will often spend time waiting on God. Because for many of us, it's the only time we do that. Hopefully it's not true. But for many of us, we live such busy lives that the Sunday service can be just another thing that we're rushing through with an agenda to get through to lunchtime. And so it's important that we learn to wait. And James underscores that again as being one of the major ingredients of a faith-filled life, is waiting on God. So I want to tackle both those things this morning. And the first part of it is the idea of wealth and faith. How do they work together? Are they also diametrically opposed? And again, I'm asking a question. I'm not giving you the answers yet. But we're going to pick the, the narrative up from James 5, from the first verse. And this is what he says. Now listen. Now, whenever you see that, and it's in Scripture, it's important that we incline, lean forward. Now, listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Now, this is not the kind of Scripture that we're probably going to be endeared to. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Sounds like a party to me. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay, the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have con condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. What an awesome scripture. You see, wealth can be a stumbling block in growing a life that's filled with faith. And you could be mistaken for thinking that I've gotten this thing 180 degrees wrong this morning. Because a lot of the teaching that is out there is the opposite. And the connection between wealth and faith is completely different to what I'm talking about this morning. In other words, if you don't have the gold ring and you don't have the young wife and you don't live in the right neighborhood, how could you possibly have any faith? We could be mistaken for thinking that that is the message that much of the church is preaching. And so wealth can be a stumbling block, according to James, to a faith-filled life. Now, I want to make it clear right from the start that money is not evil, nor is wealth. That's not what James is saying this morning. So I want to make that really clear. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and, and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so Paul and James, because they're both speaking scripture, are in agreement, even if it seems like they're not. You see, whenever scripture seems like it doesn't agree with itself, 
we've got it wrong we're not reading it correctly so we've got to come back and read it again and so the word used by Paul in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10 where I've underscored it on the screen the love of money that word is best and often traditionally translated avarice does anyone know what avarice means I reckon that's a great word Mike don't you isn't it a wonderful word avarice is um, simplistically it's greed but more specifically in the Webster dictionary it means an excessive or insatiable desire for wealth or gain and so when we understand when we read 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10 and he says for the love of money the NIV is a little bit underdone as are most of the other translations and I wish we could use the word avarice again for avarice is a root of all kinds of evil isn't it a great word I love it it's basically greed on steroids it's massive greed it's the kind of greed that drives everything we do and again as I spend my Monday mornings with God I'm getting more in tune with the desert fathers I think I'm gonna get long gray hair and I'm gonna change the color of dye that I use to, to gray just to make that happen faster but the desert fathers identified avarice as one of the seven deadly sins so if you've ever heard that term of the seven deadly sins there is an origin of that and it is Christian actually it was more likely eight or nine sins that they identified as being um, game changers in the wrong direction and so every one of those sins had an opposite and the opposite was the was the good redeeming part of character but the but for every good character there's an opposite so this is what the desert fathers understood these desert fathers formed monastic communities in the Egyptian desert as a direct result of the trappings of Christendom you know what history repeats itself so much the church today from my observation generally is not that healthy and we could in fact compare it to Christendom in some quarters and so Christendom obviously was instituted under the Roman Emperor Constantine back in the third century but see history is repeating itself all over again and many of the the mistakes of the past are being remade only when we're, we're getting more creative in the way we do that and the seven deadly sins as I said actually eight or nine probably are often thought to be abuses or excesses of different versions of one's natural faculties or passions for example gluttony abuses one's desire to eat now the desire to eat is basic to life if we don't eat we die but if we eat too much we die as well and so there's an excess in that avarice abuses one's desire to provide particularly males and again if I sound sexist I don't apologize I think I meant to say I do apologize but anyway I can't and so males often we and things are changing so there is a responsibility that women are stepping into and I, I do apologize in that respect and so the bottom line is most of us particularly males will have this built-in program that says you should you should provide for your family and so we should that's correct that's right that's God's order of things and yet if that natural desire to provide gets on steroids then it turns into avarice because not only do I want to provide but I want to provide lavishly for you my darling wife and children because it makes me look good and you cook me better meals and we have a better life all around and so avarice begins to kick in and the desert fathers believed that that deadly sin kicked in when, even in the good so even in the, the redeeming parts of our lives our natural personal traits became open doors for the demonic in effect and so when the desire for wealth comes under this kind of demonic influence it becomes a dangerous addiction that every single one of us are open to because the sin comes from generally the basic parts of life 
So like any addiction, avarice will do whatever is required to gain wealth. And this is, what, this is what's going on here. This is the dynamic of, of Timothy's, of the letter 1 Timothy. And it's also the dynamic of what James is talking about in James 5. Addictions of this uh, degree turn to avarice. And avarice is driven by fear of not having enough. That's the underlying uh, driver for it. And so when people are subject to a fear of not having enough, they generally open entry points for a spirit of poverty to then enter in. And so actually, greed and avarice are driven by the fear of not having enough, which is the overriding spirit is a spirit of poverty. It's a very technical way of saying something very simple, and I apologize for that. And so it, this spirit knows no social or economic boundaries. In other words, poverty doesn't just belong to the poor. In fact, it's more prevalent in the middle class, particularly in a Western context. Because everything about us as middle class, generally, most of us are in that category, in a country like Australia, is that we're striving for something. We live in a capitalistic society, and don't get me wrong, that's probably the best option in the world that we live in. I'm not boohooing capitalism whatsoever. Again, there is a, there's a flip side to it that's dark. And the dark side of, of that thing is that middle class people are striving to become wealthy. And we make all sorts of excuses for not having enough time, but in the end it could be just our own sinful desires. And so this spirit knows no social or economic boundaries. It thrives on avarice and it generally affects the wealthy more than the poor. One thing that we've observed over the years is it often doesn't affect the very, very wealthy. And there are some people that are born into wealth that wealth doesn't really carry any value to them. Now, I wish I had that uh, you know, perspective. I'm, so I'm speaking very theoretically on that this morning. But I've observed people over the years, so I can trust the, you know, the observational skills, I think. And that's why you can look at people like um, Bill Gates. Now, he is self-made in, in his millions. I don't think he's a Christian. But he's got towards the end of his life, and he's made squillions of dollars, you know, enough to basically underwrite a small economy, a, a national economy. And he's now at the stage where he's giving money away. He's created the Bill Gates Foundation, and I'm not giving him a plug this morning because others are doing this as well. Warren Buffett's doing it. Now, Warren Buffett, probably one of the greediest men on the planet. That's what drove his success. But these people get to a certain point where they start giving money away because they work out that it's not actually making them happy. There's no connection between money and happiness. It feels like there is for a little while. And so people who come under a spirit of poverty or avarice are never satisfied with what they have. Believers who are controlled by a spirit of poverty definitely struggle to live by faith. It's a faith blocker. I've referred in the past during this series to the contemporary faith teachers and throughout the course of this series from James because I believe this book addresses many of their errors. Interestingly, most of them quote from the book of James. And it's the very book that contains the solution to their problem. And so often the teaching contains a very subtle perversion of the truth because you, it's very difficult to, for us as consumers to uh, distinguish between those subtle sort of nuances that are going on in their teaching. But we have to be smarter than that. We can't just accept everything we hear from here, from the pulpit. And I encourage you often, whatever I say, please examine it. Because I know that sometimes I say before I think. So you need to make sure you examine it. We're all responsible to do that. And it doesn't matter how articulate the speaker is. They can either unknowingly or fully intentionally introduce something that's subtly close to the truth, but not the truth. And so I've referred to these uh, many of the contemporary faith teachers, and obviously I, they're not my friends. These people are on my list. I spoke about my list a few weeks ago. Because I believe many of them pervert the truth. The conclusion they propagate through their teaching is that if you want to get rich, then you need to give. 
Because giving gives you the means to the end. And in effect, what they're saying is, your avarice will be satisfied by giving. And they actually say that that's the way faith grows. And so the more you give, the more you get, and your faith grows, and we've all heard the mantras. But guys, this morning, we're going to really be talking as adults, because I want us to discern this stuff. We can't be ignorant. We must not just accept everything we hear in teaching. And there's nothing wrong with questioning it. You're not questioning God. You're questioning the deliverer, the person who brings the message. And so that conclusion is completely wrong. They propagate this thing that in order to receive, you need to give more. Uh, Incidentally, most of these people are flying around the world in, in incredible jets. Someone was telling me this morning that there's a preacher in the US at the moment that has a a a request out for more money so that he can buy his fourth $47 million jet. I have no idea how God could be dependent on that thing or that the gospel hinges on the fact that that person needs to have a a jet. I've got no idea how that works. It's, It's above my pay grade. Maybe there's something I'm missing. And so that conclusion, we should rightfully put a massive question mark on it. Because there's a subtle perversion of the fact that God does actually release grace through generosity. And and unfortunately, the rest of us who are looking at that with critical eyes, as we should, we can then fall into the error of being tight-fisted and going the other way. But see, the truth remains. The truth always stands. God does release grace in our generosity. There's no doubt about that. And so let's stick to the truth and not go out on the fringes. So the truth is, God loves a cheerful giver. This truth is both biblical and it's practically provable. In other words, I've interviewed lots of people in the 23 years that I've been in full-time ministry. And without hesitation, I can say that God is always faithful to to people that give, particularly when they give sacrificially. There's something about that. And Paul affirms this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 8. He says, each man, and he's referring to, it's usually ones in the Greek, each person, should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's the thing that we shouldn't hang on to. That's the absolute truth. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. There it is. The release of grace through generosity. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in mercy in every good work. So it's undeniable that there is a connection between generosity and the outpouring of God's grace. People who give cheerfully don't give in order to receive a dividend, however. You see, it's always the means to the end that becomes the problem. But what they do is that they give out of obedience to God, which goes back to what we talked about last week, is that God's called us to live in submission. That's the seedbed for faith. And so in our giving, that's part of our submission to God. If our motive is to give to get, I question that. I have a problem with it. If our motive is to give because we are in obedience to God, And we understand that in the process of doing that, he's going to pour out his merciful grace on us. Bring it on. That's absolutely what a faith-filled life is about. Obedience and submission to God are fruits of a faith-filled life. And they happen to release the grace of God. Because whenever we live in submission to God, we, we get to experience a bit of heaven. And so that's the truth. The perversion is that giving with the motive of getting, is a problem. At every level, there's many problems that pop out from this, and yet that's a very, very popular teaching. Verse 3 of James 5 says, to people who live life this way particularly, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. You see, it's a motive. It's a motivational thing. 
Jesus says it this way, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, the best investment we can make is in the kingdom of God. You see, disciples of Jesus have no choice in this. We have no choice. We must be generous towards God's work. Now, I'm not saying this is a question of salvation. God's not going to strike you down because you didn't tithe to the cent. I wish he would sometimes because our offering would go through the roof. It only have to happen once. But that's not the way it is. So I've got to tell the truth. We have a biblical mandate as believers to tithe to the local church. I believe that with everything I have. And additionally, we have a mandate to exercise generosity towards the works of the kingdom. And so there's an obligatory part of our giving, and there's a, then there's a part of our giving that comes out of the overflow, that it's important that we're doing that as well. This part of storing, this is part, I should say, of storing up the treasures in heaven, and it's only part. It's only the beginning because it comes out of, as Paul says, the cheerfulness. It comes out of the fact that we're in submission to God and we owe him so much. Now, we can't repay him for what we owe him, but the giving part of it, the generosity, says, God, we are so thankful and it sends him a signal. And so it's part of storing up treasure in heaven. Tithing and generosity indicate that we believe God can do more with the 90% than we can do with the 100%. It takes faith to believe that because the math doesn't add up, does it? He says in verse 6, You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposed to you. You see, avarice is demonic. And it will do whatever it can to achieve the goal. And particularly here, James is talking to those in authority, the bosses. And what he's saying there is, if you're exploiting your workers for your own means, then you're in trouble. You've got a a, a set of crosshairs on you and you don't want to take that hit. You see, people who ambitiously strive for wealth invariably destroy the lives of others, either directly or indirectly either intentionally or unintentionally, there are always uh, victims of those circumstances. So whenever we strive to make money for little effort, someone else pays the bill. There's only so many dollars in the world. They don't fall out of heaven. They come from somewhere. And so the message that goes along the lines of Christians should be rich so that we can dominate The flip side of that is that someone else has to pay the bill. And I don't see the gospel pitched that way. What I do see is that as God's church, we are meant to be blessing the world so that they can see God in us, not exploiting the world and taking from it. Again, wealth in itself isn't sinful, but the desire for wealth is thwart with danger. It's a minefield. I haven't met too many people who can navigate that thing. I do believe that some people in the church are called to be filthy rich because God's done something in their heart that allows them to give away money in a supernatural way. Almost it seems like they're giving away more than they're making. Maybe that's the case because that's the way supernatural stuff works. James is specifically in this part of his letter addressing avarice, the love of money, the lust for money. And he's warning that that thing is a faith killer. Remember the book of James is is the manual for faith. So we need to remember in our manual, avoid the lust for wealth. It's just going to kill faith basically. And then the second part of what I want to speak about this morning, it refers to the patience in waiting. Now, I'd like to say that I've got this lovely three-point sermon that expresses what I want to communicate this morning. But you know, when you exposit, you take what you get. 
and the next passage is something different. So we're just going to take it in order. James 5 verse 7. And here he says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. Isn't it interesting that patience is required directly after James addresses issues of money? Always very interesting because people that have a lust for money are generally very impatient people. So he goes on from there to say, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. In my version, it's got an exclamation mark there. It wasn't in the Greek, but I think it belongs there. Verse 10, brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we considered blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, or you will be condemned. You see, again, verses 7 through 12 underscore the importance of patience and perseverance. And if faith is the goal of James, I think patience and perseverance is the vehicle that he uses right through the book. Again, as we wait on the coming of the kingdom, that's where faith is built as we wait in patience. Now, I get impatient waiting for the kingdom. I don't know about you. I'm being honest this morning and transparent. And yet, God's calling us to be patient, to patiently await the coming of Christ or the coming of the kingdom. And in, you know, in the patient waiting, sometimes God just surprises us and he gives us an advanced deposit of what's to come. That's when we see people get healed. That's when we see people... Um, delivered, that's when we see lives changed in an instant sometimes. I wish it was like that all the time. And yet God gives us a glimpse of those and then says, now be patient. I think those things are meant to be faith boosters. They're meant to show us what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. Because at the end of the day, as believers, it really doesn't matter whether God heals us or not. It might to you, if you're the person that needs healing, but at the end of the day, if you're a believer and you're in Christ, even though you be destroyed now, you have eternal life. You, we often forget that thing, particularly in the charismatic side of church. We often want it all now, don't we? So I don't get too phased when people don't get healed if they're believers. Because I know that ultimately they're going to see Jesus face to face. But I love it when God heals people. It's such a faith booster. It's so good and I wish we could see more of that and I'm going to keep praying because when we do see it, it's such a wonderful thing. But verses 7 through 12 underscore the importance of faith and perseverance as we wait for the coming of Jesus. I think James understood how easy it is to be impatient in the face of the imminence of the coming kingdom because scripture on the one hand says that the coming of Christ is imminent we're living in the last days, as we have been for the last 2,000 years. And that in itself requires incredible patience. It's like anticipating someone's arrival at your front door and they're late. I hate that. He expresses that kind of imminence by saying, don't grumble against each other. The inference there is that while you're waiting, wait nicely. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The, ju the judge is standing at the door. Now, I remember as kids, and again, maybe this applies to you, maybe it was just me. But my younger brother and I, we, we didn't have, you know, iPads and internet, and we had none of that stuff. The internet wasn't invented. In fact, I was working in IT when the internet started, when people started you know, looking at Netscape and some of the big old browsers that we used to have. And a, a couple of us IT mates, we'd stand around the tea room and say, this thing will never get off the ground. How wrong we were. But anyway, as kids, my younger brother and I, 
we'd get really excited when we knew that our cousins were coming around to hang out with us. Now, I think I had about 40 or 50 cousins. Normans are prolific breeders. If you go to the southeast of South Australia, every second person is either a Norman or they know a Norman. Anyway, so we'd get really excited when we knew that one of our cousins were coming to hang out with us for the day. It was so good because we didn't have any other entertainment so we could beat them up and play with them and, you know, we'd all come home with snotty noses at the end of the day. It was just a hoot. And we, I used to get really annoyed when they were late. If they said they were going to be there at 11, I was there ready. I was sitting at the front door waiting for the doorbell to ring. And it seemed like hours when they were late when in fact it was usually only a few minutes. I was anything but patient. I still have that trait about me. I'm sure there's a dark side to that. And usually after a few minutes, while I was waiting with my brother, we would end up rolling around the floor having a massive blue. To the point where mum would need to intervene, there was usually blood or cuts and crying and tears. And by the time our cousins got there, we were banned and we had to go to our rooms in any case. And so impatience is a real joy killer. It's a horrible thing. And so when James says, be patient in the waiting, it always reminds me of that situation. The arrival of the kingdom is a sure thing. It's just as sure as my auntie turning up and pushing the doorbell with all the kids. And we'd had a hoot. So the arrival of the kingdom is a sure thing. In verse 10, he says, Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering... Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. These guys must have had incredible patience. They were seeing things that were going to happen in hundreds of years' times that their own eyes wouldn't even see. What kind of patience does that require? There are many in this room, perhaps all of us, who won't see Christ before we die. Our forefathers and generations before us had the hope of living in the generation that would be here in the, at the coming of Christ. And we're called to be patient for that. And so patience and perseverance are important. They are indicators that we're full of faith and that we have no need to be anxious because we're secure in what's going on. I don't know about you, but I absolutely hate waiting rooms. I have a particular doctor who shall remain nameless. That when I t have a doctor's appointment, he's notorious for being an hour late. And I always arrive early for appointments. If I ever have coffee with you, I'm always there on time. If I'm not, there's been a disaster that's happened. The car hasn't started. I've been stuck in traffic massively because I usually leave early. And I hate waiting for an appointment. And I hate people that keep me waiting. So don't do it. That's the dark side of the pastor. I'm sorry. I get agitated and murderous thoughts go through my mind. <laughs> Trust me. They have free reign with my mind. I've got to rein them in all the time. And so the, the past few years, there's been a revolution going on in my life, as many of you know. And I've started to develop a little seed of patience. And I've started showing up late occasionally. But this is not my normal disposition, I've got to tell you. And I'm still uncomfortable with it. But after spending solitary time with God in the desert, something has stimulated my faith and patience has started to kick in. Now it's foreign to me, so just bear with me for the next few years as I learn this thing. But guys, patience is a faith builder. Because it, the root of patience is in trust. And out of trust comes faith. Because when you trust someone, you have faith in what they say. Whatever they say, you know they're going to deliver, whether it seems they're late or not. And so now when I go to a doctor's appointment, I generally take a book. And I, if it's my doctor, I could probably get through half the book waiting for him. But anyway, that's, that's the way it is. And so I, what I've learned to do in the midst of waiting is to go, what's going on here, God? This is something I'm learning, so bear with me. You know, you always knew that I could be spiritual. Well, it's starting to work. And what I'm seeing happen now in the midst of people being late on me is that there are divine appointments tied up in there. And so I'm often sitting down in Balthazar waiting for someone to show up for coffee and thinking, we made an appointment. 
where is this dude? I've probably scared everybody off from ever having coffee with me now. Sorry, Andy, it's not you. You're always early as well. And, and so what takes place in the midst of all that is that God often has stuff for me to do. There's someone there that needs to be spoken to. Or someone tells me that they've got this pain in their leg or they're feeling sad or something. And there's always a divine appointment in the midst of that. But you see, impatience never sees that. Because impatience is too wrapped up in the dark side of sin. Because how dare you keep me waiting? I'm important. And so impatience will never see those people. You see, it's too infuriated by the waiting. And yet, so importantly, James says that patience is integral to the faith-filled life. Now, I wish I had have learnt this stuff years ago. The church might be bigger. We might all be in heaven by now. So it's probably people like me that have caused the Lord to tarry. But anyway, have patience. Because God is in this. And if we can exercise these things, if we can take the book of James to heart, I firmly believe that that would be a total game.